Hello, everybody. Happy Wednesday, August the 8th, 2018. So that makes it 8 8 18. And uh, let me share this first before I get started and give some time for people to pop on. I am uh, inside, obviously, today. I was wanting to be outside, but unfortunately, there are people next door that are working on a house and they're cutting these concrete blocks. So I can't go outside like I was planning because it's too noisy out there right now. So therefore, I am inside um, doing my Facebook Live, which it's only like 77 degrees right now. It's supposed to be like 108 degrees later this afternoon and I will probably go for a walk and I always like to have adventures and when it's extremely hot or extremely cold I always like to get out in the weather just to uh, see what it's like and to have some fun because I enjoy adventures so anyway today is 8818 and the number eight in the Bible, since it's 8818, signifies resurrection and regeneration. It is the number of a new beginning. Eight is seven plus one. And since it comes just after seven, which uh, itself signifies an end to something, so eight is also associated with the beginning of a new era. So we just declare over everyone watching today that something new is going to happen in your life, something uh, that you're, that's unexpected, an unexpected connection, unexpected blessing, unexpected uh, overcoming a trial or tribulation that you've been going through a season of in your life. Um, so anyway, last night I got the fortune of going to Jeremy Camp concert. Uh, for those of you that don't know Jeremy Camp, he is from Lafayette, Indiana and his parents lived next to my brother. And so I got to visit with Jeremy um, at his parents' home back in, uh, I think it was the end of 2007. And uh, you could tell he worked out, he has muscles. <laughs> you know, I like to work out, but I don't really have that many muscles. I try to just uh, stay unflabby, I guess. And uh, so last night he was there and you could tell he had uh, continued his uh, working out. In fact, when he, when his parents lived next, uh, his parents were, uh, his dad was a pastor. Well, I think maybe still is, but his, uh, when his parents lived next door to my brother, they were getting ready to move down to uh, Nashville because that's where Jeremy apparently had built a home. I'm assuming he still lives there, but I'll uh, give kudos out to my brother. I know um, when, before Jeremy became famous, he was in California. I guess he needed a flight back to Lafayette uh, in Indianapolis and uh, maybe didn't have the money for it, I think, at the time. And so my brother gave him a frequent flyer, uh, Miles, so that he could actually use that to fly back. He had lost his wife to cancer, which I think most people know. He talked about that last night. So again, um, he, I'm sure, would never remember me, but I, I met with him for maybe, I don't know, 30 minutes or something like that. And... Uh, and um, so anyway, he was there and Franklin Graham was there. It's just kind of, again, ironic, the timing. You know, when I was in Billings, Montana, whatever, a couple weeks ago, Vice President Pence was there. And I had uh, got to talk to Vice President Pence before he became governor of Indiana. He was on a radio talk show, WIBC in Indianapolis. We were talking about raising the speed limit and I was giving him my encouragement of wanting to do that because I traveled a lot back and forth uh, for a couple of hours um, in the state of Indiana. So anyway, I enjoyed myself last night, had a good time. The Lord told me to have fun, you know, enjoy myself. That's what we, the Lord wants all of us to do, is to enjoy our lives. And so there was literally, I don't know how many thousands of people that were there. There were hundreds of people that gave their life to the Lord. You know, of course, my thoughts are, boy, once you get, give your life to the Lord, the next thing to do is logically take them through deliverance so that they can be freed from any and all demonic spirits because the spirits don't leave. Once you give your life to Christ, they still are able to torment you in your mind and uh, that's why we see a lot of people in the church that suffer with the spirits of Jezebel, Leviathan, and Ahab. So that's the next logical thing. I guess people in Africa do that. They automatically take people when they give their life to Christ, at least a lot of them, through deliverance because you have to get rid of those demons. Otherwise, they continue to torment them. 
doesn't matter once you say, hey, I want Christ to come into my heart, if you still have these soul wounds and you still hear, you know, the enemy has a legal right to torment you, then you will not be at peace and you will be continu continually harassed and tormented by the voice of the enemy in your thoughts and it will cause you to ruin your relationships. So anyway, it was, uh, I enjoyed, you know, uh, you know the, the heart of Franklin Graham. I enjoyed the music of Jeremy Camp. And I left um, before Jeremy did like his last song or song so that I could beat some of the traffic back to the home I'm staying at. And so I got home a little after nine o'clock and the family uh, had gone to bed already. And so I um, ended up coming in towards the front door. And as I was walking towards the front door, I noticed on the outside that there was a snake. And I, it was interesting because I had uh, um, sensed when I first came here that I was going to run into a snake. In fact, it was specifically a rattlesnake that I sensed the Lord was going to uh, somehow. I mean, he was kind of giving me the heads up that I'd be uh, coming into contact with it and to not be into fear, of course, because if we get into fear and worry, then we're on the enemy's camp. And that's exactly what a lot of times these enemy, uh, you know, these, these uh, whatever, animals that were created by God that have a, a viciousness to them, they can sense if a human being is in fear. Same thing with the, uh, the enemy within a person. If they have the spirit of Jezebel Leviathan, they can sense if, they, if you're in fear and they want to come after you. They want to shut you down. They want to control, manipulate you. They want to threaten you. You know, that's exactly what happened. So last night as I'm walking towards the snake, uh, I just sense the Lord said, videotape this to show this kind of as an example of what we're supposed to do in the spirit realm with people, but also in the physical realm with, you know, rattlesnakes that are poisonous, whatever, is to take our authority and not worry about it. And so it was literally trying to keep me from coming into the front door, keeping me from my destiny of my bed so I could go to sleep. And so as I approached it, then, uh, and I didn't even know it was a rattlesnake and still I, I mean, I turned on the video, I had no clue until I started hearing go rattle, 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 rattle. <laughs> and that's pretty uh, apparent at that point. It wasn't a large snake by any means, but I guess I've heard that the smaller ones are more poisonous, I guess, than even the bigger ones. So I had no clue until this morning about that. So anyway, as I'm walking towards it, I really had a sense of just an annoyance, thinking, really, enemy? You think you're gonna try and stop me from getting into the front door? Plus, I knew that they were going to be hosting Friday night, um, a freedom night here, night of deliverance for people. So the enemy does not want, obviously, people to come. He does everything that he can to fight people getting set free in deliverance. That's one of the most, uh, if, if not the most, um, probably is the most uh, challenging of any ministries is deliverance. Uh, because when you truly get delivered, man, you are so on powerful, you know, on with the Lord. The anointing is so strong and so forth. So as I'm approaching it with the videotape, recording it, and then I start hearing the little rattle thing going, and uh, everything in me wanted to like I'd grab a shovel and just cut its neck off because um, I don't like, you know, I don't like snakes to begin with, but the rattlesnake, you know, I mean, there's garter snakes that are healthy. They end up, what, eating, I don't know, flies or something, you know, and I've ran over them a couple times with my lawnmower when I was in, in Indianapolis, but Never in my life had I ever encountered a rattlesnake other than being behind windows <laughs> that were at a zoo or something. So anyway, as I got closer, I was like, okay, you know, buddy, you stay where you're at. I didn't say anything other than I said, uh, I curse you <laughs> as I opened the unlock. Uh, I guess the door was unlocked, so I ended up just coming in the door. And then I just had glanced back and told the snake that I cursed it and expected it to be gone, basically. And then I closed the door behind me and then I went to bed and had nice dreams, didn't have any fear or worries, and um, woke up this morning, walked outside, looked outside to make sure there was a rattlesnake was gone, and it was gone, so I don't know where it went, but it was interesting because the homeowner said that they've lived here for a couple of years in this home and have never seen, I guess, any snakes, and uh, I've talked to some other local people that lived here for like over, I think, seven years and had never seen one snake even though that they are known to have rattlesnakes in this area. So anyway, it is very much a desert out here in South uh, East uh, Washington, the Tri-Cities they call it, which composed of Kennewick and Richland and um, Pasco. So um, what does it say in Luke ten nineteen? I think we all heard this. Behold, I give you the authority to trample on serpents and scorpions 
and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall by any means hurt you. So uh, when we truly believe that verse, then we don't fear and we don't worry. I know a lot of people are like, oh my gosh, I can't believe that's so scary. And that kind of shows us maybe where our level of faith is at because in the past, I would have probably freaked out and not even come in the front door. But I knew it was trying to keep me from my destiny, trying to stop me through fear. That's what the enemy literally tries to do is, oh my gosh, you know, this is so scary. You know, and he'll oftentimes cause fear, which is false evidence appearing real, to have you focus on that stuff instead of uh, learning what your authority is in Christ and then walking in it. We have to walk in our authority. We have to know it. Most Christians have no clue what their authority is because they're never taught it. And if they are taught it, they're taught it once maybe. Um, in my case, I know that I was first exposed to this back in 2009 and it changed my life. But the enemy kept coming against me. You know, first with the toothache. You know, after I prayed for my son to get delivered, he got delivered instantly. But first I had a toothache that came on me and it was extremely painful. The Lord told me to take my authority, which I did at two in the morning and it worked. Instantly I was delivered from that pain. The spirit of infirmity was gone. Um, then it was a couple months later that I reached over a gate to pick up some uh, dogs and my back popped out. I heard the disc pop very loudly and I was in so much extreme pain and I commanded it to be healed, not that day, but the next day. And it started to lessen little by little. It was an instant, but it was over about a 48 hour period. And then it was gone. Then I had a bulge the size of a golf ball on the size of my back. Again, the enemy was trying to speak to me, but I started to shut him down after a few words because he was trying to tell me it was cancer, it was a cyst, it was whatever, tumor. And I would not let him get a whole sentence in because if I did, I would get into fear and I would end up having to go to the, uh, you know, the doctor, because I would have gotten into fear and that's where my faith would have been at at that point. So it was so important for every one of us to learn our authority. And it's a, it's a, a process. It's something that we cannot just obtain overnight. We can't just read about it. We have to experience it. We have to go through it. And I'd say probably 95% of Christians have no clue what their authority is. And if I'm a pastor, the first thing I would do when someone gets saved is get them delivered. The second thing I would do is train them and teach them in their authority. And there's a lot of pastors that don't know their own authorities in Christ. And uh, so anyway, uh, food for thought. So today, Holy Spirit told me to talk about counting every trial and tribulation as joy. Uh, a lot of us go through stuff. Those that are the more anointed have to go through more of the battle against the enemy. It's par for the course. It's the only way you can become a Moses. It's the only way you can become an Abraham is you have to battle against a lot of people that have the enemy within them. And it's just par for the course. You know, I had to do it myself, some extreme stuff. You know, when people have the Jezebel spirit, Leviathan spirit, they're extremely good at lying. They can act all sweet and nice in front of people, in front of their faces, but then behind closed doors, they're a completely different animal. They're like the snake, they're like the uh, rattlesnake that tries to strike against you. In fact, rattlesnakes and snakes in general are the symbol for Jezebel. You know, alligators are the symbol for Leviathan. And uh, so James 1, two through eight says, my brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. And that's the only thing I'll just speak to because I never was patient before. I wanted to think a lot of people aren't patient. They want things now. And we live in a very impatient society and an impatient church. We want to get healed now, instantly. If it doesn't work, we give up on it. You know, when I got healed from my bulge in my back the size of a golf ball, it took like six weeks. It was a long time process. I could have given up any time during that time frame, gotten into fear, and then my faith would have been in the doctors saying, okay, I got to go to the doctors. That's where I'm going to get my healing at. And who knows, it could have been a cyst, it could have been a tumor, it could have been cancerous. But I did not look on the circumstances, even though it was painful, even though I slept on it, even though I didn't share it with my wife because she didn't have the same faith level that I did. But uh, ultimately, I did share with her after six weeks when she started having blurriness in her vision because the Lord said that she was gonna have something come on her body very similar soon after. Um, and she needed to have her faith level raised. So I ended up sharing it with her and she prayed for me, I prayed for her. And then she got healed instantly of her blurriness of her vision. It took me another couple days, three days before it started to shrink just a tiny bit. 
And then about two weeks later, it was completely gone, but it was a long process. Then it, then it tried to come back like uh, a year later. Again, it was about half the size of a golf ball. I commanded it to go on my own, and it took about 11 days before it shrank to nothing. But if we get into fear and get into worry, you're on the enemy's territory, and he can have at you. And there's so many of us that will speak out words, being complaining about our circumstances and so forth. Sometimes you have to suck it up and take it and do it. And it's gonna be good for you because ultimately in the end you're getting stronger. There's too many weak Christians that drink milk that it's time to start eating steak. It's time to actually go through some real big trials and tribulations. And that's the only way, in fact, it was in 2000, what was it, 2000, um, ended, well, in 2008 when I started to hear the Lord and began in 2009 when the Lord kind of shared with me what I was gonna to have to go through at some level. I didn't know the depths of it, but it was pretty extreme. Um, but anyway, it was building me, building the character in me to be able to do what I'm doing today and helping people get set free from these spirits because the enemy wants to come against me more than anything to shut me down from helping couples to be able to save their marriages so they don't strive and fight and argue anymore and to teach individuals about their authority so they can walk in that. So, um, I mean, in fact, I'm gonna go there. I wasn't gonna go there. The Holy Spirit wants me to go there. So, so this, I got married in March 2009. The Lord told me then on my wedding night um, that I would love my spouse like Christ loved the church. He told me that beforehand, but what it was gonna involve, a lot of uh, suffering, a lot of stuff, and I couldn't tell anybody. I had to go through this without telling a soul on earth, which turned out to be six years. It was a lot longer than I would have expected, but ultimately in September, October of 2009, we went to Israel and I'd never been to Israel before. And at one point we stopped off near the Dead Sea at a cantina. And um, a lot of the local people um, that were on the buses, there was about 200 of us, most of them, probably 80% got off the bus and just had lunch at the cantina. That's all that they did. Then there was about another 20% that took an hour walk to get back to this waterfall where David used to have his you know, water and take baths and stuff when he was hiding from Saul trying to kill him. Then there was just me and my wife and one other couple that took the treacherous journey to climb up this uh, very dangerous without railings um, mountain with rocks where you could slip off and fall and die at any point in time. And, and, and we're climbing up it and you have to be very careful. You have to pull yourself up because you could slip off of it and, and die. I mean, it was very dangerous. But once we got to the top where there's a cave up at the very top, you could see for miles and miles and miles in every direction. I mean, you could see all the Dead Sea. And uh, I mean, you could probably see in one direction at least, I don't know, 25 miles or something. And it was hot, it was very deserty. But when I got up at the very top, the Lord spoke to me extremely clearly, not audibly, but in my mind. And he showed me symbolically, and he spoke to me symbolically and said, most Christians that are in the church will only get off the bus and have lunch at the cantina. That's all that they will do. They go to church basically and they go back home and they've not been changed. They're the same person they were before and they operate you know, on these hideous spirits of Jezebel, Leviathan, Ahab, and they don't get changed, they don't get delivered. Um, and then the, those that become teachers and pastors and have a heart to really press in even more, those are the people that symbolize those taking the hour walk, hour journey back for the waterfall. But he told me, he said, very few are gonna be like you who are gonna take the time to go all the way up to the top of the mountain. It's gonna be very treacherous and very hard. The enemy's gonna come against you extreme, extreme ways. But when you actually finish this and it's completed, it'll all be worth it in the end. And look at the glory, look at all that you can see. And so I knew at that point right then, right there, I'm like, I don't care how hard this journey is gonna be. I don't care what I have to do. I'm gonna do it because I wanna see this in the spirit realm, how whatever it's gonna be, whatever the ministry might be, I don't care what it was. I'm determined, I'm not a quitter. In fact, I'd run like something like five or six marathons in my life. So no matter what it took, I'm gonna do this. I don't care how hard that it is, how hard the journey's gonna be, how much suffering I'm gonna have to go through, I'm gonna go through it to the very end because I wanna make you know, the Lord proud of me, number one, but also I wanna affect the lives of as many millions of people as possible. 
And so I had no clue what this ministry was gonna be. All I knew it was gonna be extremely, extremely hard. I never envisioned that it would be my wife that would actually be used by the enemy. I thought we were gonna be on the same team. But um, anyway, um, now I look back and I see all that the Lord has taken me through. And it was extreme, extreme stuff, a lot of stuff. And I couldn't tell anybody. That was the hardest thing. I didn't tell anybody. I didn't tell my children about it. I didn't tell my pastor about it. I didn't tell my my family about it. I remember going out to lunch once with my brother. Everything in my flesh wanted to speak to him about the, the horribleness of what I was going through, but I bit my tongue. I said nothing. And that was so hard, and it's probably so hard for most Christians, is you want to speak it out to everyone and say, my gosh, I'm going through hell with my spouse. I'm going through hell with, you know, my children, whatever. And I get it. You know, if, if you're not going to be called into that type of ministry, then Yes, you know, you, you do, but you need to be careful of who you share with. You need to share with those that are going to be tight-lipped because you don't want to have the entire church talking gossip. That's what the Jezebel spirit will do is it will talk gossip to the church and lie, manipulate. It will tell lies about the, the person that they're married to, whereas the person that's being abused will tell the truth and people won't even believe it because some of the abuse is so crazy. So once we do speak about it, we share a little bit about it, and in some cases you may have to separate from your spouse, then that makes it more aware. The family members become more aware of what's going on, but then there's gonna be a battle between the lies and the truth of what's going on. So, so anyway, back to James 1, 2 through 8. It says, My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. But let patience have its perfect work, that you may be perfect and complete lacking nothing. If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God, who gives to all liberally and without reproach, and it will be given to him. But let him ask in faith with no doubting, for he who doubts is like a wave of the sea driven and tossed by the wind. For let not that man suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord. He is a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. So there's a lot of you know, a lot of, a lot of meat in that whole verses there is when you're going through stuff, understand that it's all going to be worth it in the end. Do not take on the victim mentality and saying, oh me, oh my, I can't go on any further. I can't do this. Don't ever speak any words into your circumstances. Speak life and speak boldness and confidence and be a mighty man and woman of valor. That is who God created you to be. If you can't do that, then the enemy will have his way with you. You'll be a double-minded man. You'll be unstable in all your ways. Um, I'm gonna read this too. 2 Corinthians 11, 22 through 31. This is an example of what Paul went through. It says, are they Hebrews? So am I. Are they Israelites? So am I. Are they the seed of Abraham? So am I. Are they ministers of Christ? I speak as a fool, I am more in labors more abundant, in stripes above measure, in prisons more frequently, in deaths often. From the Jews, five times I received 40 stripes minus one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. Of course, he was bitten by a rattlesnake and didn't die. A night and a day I have been in the deep in journeys often, in perils of water, in perils of robbers, in perils of my own countrymen, in perils of the Gentiles, in perils in the city, in perils in the wilderness, in perils in the sea, in perils among false brethren. And again, that goes back to, uh, uh, you think about it, the thorn in, his, in the flesh. You know, that was a messenger sent to buffet him by Satan. So oftentimes we have people that are, have Jezebel spirits that will lie about us that will come against you as you're going through your battle. But it's all to make you stronger in the Lord. What doesn't kill you will make you stronger in the Lord. In weariness and toil and in sleeplessness often, in hunger and thirst, in fastings often, in cold and nakedness, besides the other things, what comes upon me daily? My deep concern for all the churches. Who is weak and I am not weak? Who is made to stumble, and I do not burn with indignation? If I must boast, I will boast in the things which concern my infirmity. The God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who is blessed forever, knows that I am not lying. So yeah, he went through hell. 
He went through a lot, a lot more than all of us have gone through. And if he can do it, we can do it. And so I'm here to speak to you to say, whatever you're going through, it's a process, it's a journey. You know, literally I'm going on a journey now. You know, I'm traveling around places. I don't have a home anymore. I don't have um, uh, anything, I don't have an apartment. Of course, I don't need one because I'm traveling everywhere. It'd be a waste of money. But it's a process, it's a journey. And there's people that I encounter throughout this journey who have challenges in their lives and I'm trying to encourage them all over the place to be strong in the Lord, that you can do it. You are an overcomer. No weapon formed against you will prosper. If you encounter a rattlesnake outside, you will not get into fear, that you'll be bold to be able to walk past the rattlesnake or cut its neck off, you know, um, and not be afraid. We get into fear and worry the enemy, that's what he does. Fear is false evidence appearing real. And we're gonna have to go through stuff. It makes you stronger, it makes you stronger in the spirit. It stretches you. You get stronger and stronger when you go through these trials. No, we don't want to go through them. I know that. We want to have fun and enjoy life. I, I do as well. But I'm going to have to go through stuff. I know that. I'm going to have to go through more stuff than I could ever imagine. You know, right now, everything in the past has been building, building, building. You know, what's going to happen if I have to come against, you know, large churches, organized churches where there's Jezebels and Leviathan-spirited people that are in operation, and I have to address it with them. I don't want to do that. I don't have to, you know, who wants to do that? Well, if you're anointed to do that, you'll do that. You know, it's going to be, the harvest is going to be plentiful when we get all these people set free. And it's needed before Christ comes back. We have to have a pure and spotless bride. There's so many Christians that are not truly saved. They're not going to, if they, if they have Jezebel and Leviathan, they're operating in that every day. They got to get delivered from that before they can actually go to heaven. I know that because I've had people tell me that after they got delivered, Nelson, I would never have gone to heaven. I was being horrible about my, to my husband, to my wife behind closed doors. I was not being nice, you know, and I was being mean to my children, controlling, manipulative. Once he got delivered, they could admit that. So again, I'm writing the book Pure and Spotless. I'm going to try to write a lot of that today. Yesterday I was, um, I wrote a little bit because I had a lot of distractions. So I may just turn my phone off completely and get her done because it needs to be done. And it's not fun having to address this stuff, but there are several people that are out there in this world that are prophets that are saying, you know what, this is true. We need to be pure and spotless. There's too many people in our lives and stuff that are tolerating Jezebel, Leviathan, tolerating sin. You know, people think once they've given their life to Christ, oh, it's a good deal, I'm good to go. I can keep on doing whatever I want. I can. I can lie, I can manipulate, I, I can uh, be prideful, I can be in hidden sin, sexually, all this stuff. No, you can't. Uh, so anyways, um, so it's a journey. It's a journey that we're all going through. So try again, speak life, and recognize that every trial and tribulation you're going through, God's using it for your good. He's preparing you for your future, getting you stronger. We should get stronger every single day, not weaker. And there's a lot of people that want us to spoon feed them. No, we're not gonna spoon feed you. You, know, you have to do your own homework. You have to read the Bible for yourself. You have to press in. You have to listen to the Lord for yourself. You cannot just you know, have listen to someone and then not do anything the rest of the, the day. It's time to pray in tongues, to, to press in, hear the Lord's voice, you know, do things that are harder and to get stronger and stronger and stronger. And again, you'll know it when your fruit, your true fruit, you know, over time, it lasts. There's a lot of people that you know, are believing lies. In fact, the Holy Spirit wants me to go there on this topic. A lot of people, of course, that have Jezebel Leviathan will be speaking lies about people constantly. And they'll twist the truth. They'll try to you know, say things that were not even true or they'll try to make things up to make people not believe the truth. And you would be amazed at how much of that goes on throughout your life where you're believing lies sometimes years and years and years about a person maybe about your child, maybe about your spouse, that were not even true. And when you finally have the revelation, man, so it's like, wow, I can't believe I was believing this lie the entire time. You know, the Lord wants to help us to know the truth. And you'll, you'll discern the truth. You know, I can discern pretty highly now because I've dealt with so many at the Jezebel level that are pretty high. And so uh, when someone tries to uh, come into the ministry and to, you know, kiss up to me or anyone else in the ministry, we can discern that. We can understand what's going on if it's not genuine. We need to be the real deal behind closed doors and in front of the camera, in front of the church, uh, and so forth. So anyway, um, 
all good stuff. Again, count everything you're going through as, as if you can see it from God's perspective, an eagle eye perspective, it's for your benefit. You know, there's, and there's, I'll say this, if you're operating in Jezebel, Leviathan spirit, now you may be going through stuff, if you're operating in those spirits, that the Lord is making your circumstances worse and worse and worse to get you to finally be honest, to tell the truth and to give up and to repent of the pride that you're in. You know, so there's two different ways. If you are, if you are gotten set free from that spirit, Jezebel, Leviathan, Ahab, and you're simply getting stronger every day in the Lord, then yeah, you can count out all as joy because what you're going through is just gonna make you stronger. It's just a little skirmish here or there. It's just a little rattlesnake here and there that come in that try to scare you, um, but it's all good. But yeah, if you're operating in an evil spirit and you're tolerating Jezebel, Leviathan, the Lord will make your circumstances worse to make you come to the end of your life. You know, some cases people die early. We've seen that, we've talked about that. A woman that was 32 years of age that was married to a pastor in um, Ohio, Ironton, Ohio. She refused to get delivered from it. She died from hemorrhaging from her mouth. She was only 32. There was a woman that was in her 50s, early 50s from New Zealand that had that spirit and she was confronted, denied, did not want to get rid of it and she died after her family confronted her, taking two steps to walk away. So um, anyways, um, there's a difference. You know, if you are doing, if you're in the Lord's will and you're battling Jezebel in your spouse or anyone else, and that's normally par for the course, you have to battle that spirit, just like Elijah had to battle it, just like every great man of God in the Bible had to battle people that had those spirits. And it's no fun, no fun. That's why Paul said, you know, hey, it's a thorn in my flesh, thorn in my side, you know, I want that taken care of. Please, Lord, can't you just take that person out of my life? that messenger that was sent to buffet me by Satan. Because again, that was a saying they said back then. Um, there's a in fact, uh, I know Andrew Womack talks about this. Kenneth Copeland talks about that. That was a saying. as a messenger sent to buffet him by Satan. So that was a person that was a pain, a thorn in his side. Like we say, a pain in the butt now. You know, I've had people that are pains in the butts that are out there trying to, whatever, spread lies and so forth. So we just have to uh, deal with it. We have to go through it and know it's hard horrible for some people it's awful because you love your spouse you know i love my spouse but i couldn't get her freed it was a free will thing they had to choose to be honest they had to choose to repent and we cannot overtake a person's free will as much as we would like to we'd uh we can pray that their scales are removed from their eyes but ultimately we have to give them to the lord and let them let the lord hopefully bring them to the conclusion of where they need to be at to get set free so Anyways, um, so tonight I'm going to be speaking to the youth and uh, to the young adults at Life Church 7 in uh, Richland. And uh, then on Friday night, it will be open here at this home, open to the public, so you can come in and get set free. It's a Restored to Freedom night. Uh, again, for the address, you can uh, private message me or private message Don casanova Linegar, and you can get the address. We're expecting... Uh, a great crowd of uh, folks coming from all over the place. Um, you know, sometimes we've had people drive six, seven hours. So um, excited about that. Um, again, that's this Friday at 7 p.m. And then August the 20th, I will be at the Days Inn in uh, Coeur d'Alene, Idaho. That will be at seven o'clock. And then it uh, looks like I'm gonna be heading towards Portland to do an event in Portland. I've got some people that are reaching out. so. Stay tuned on that. It'll probably be either the, the, the end, of, uh, end of August or very early September. Um, so those Portlanders or whatever they're called, um, looking forward to that. In fact, my former boss uh, from my business company that I used to work for lives in Portland, so I'm gonna connect with him. So again, um, anyone that wants to know what the address is gonna be this coming Friday night, you have to private message me. So send a message on uh, on Facebook and then we'll respond. I'm not gonna respond on this uh, thread here, so. All right, um, 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 I think that's it. God's doing great things. In fact, August, um, I know personal Lord, uh, I ended up paying a debt that I did not owe, paid it off completely, and the Lord said, it's finished, it's done, and had given me a dream of some significant increase financially to help really launch uh, uh, restored your freedom. So get ready, I'm expecting, I love it uh, when I have a dream, because I have a lot of dreams. These dreams are very prophetic, they come to pass, and they help give me a lot of guidance as to 
where the Lord's taking me. And so for all of you guys out there um, that are waiting, I know that Sidney Jacobs also had a thing on the Elijah list talking about um, restitution, how when the enemy has stolen a lot of our money and so forth, that it's payback time. You know, so I believe that this month of August for a lot of people that have been positioned to where they're battling, battling the enemy for finances and so forth, get ready to receive. Again, we're all on different timelines. I can't, you know, I'm, I'll never make a general statement that all of us are going to get blessed financially because that's not true. Anyone that says that's not true, you have to be in the right position to receive it. You have to have gone through. You have to make sure you don't have Jezebel, Leviathan operating your life. So it's important. And then to uh, get yourself freed from the enemy junk. And then the Lord will bless. But it's not going to be a blanket blessing for everybody out there. You know, there's people that are out there operating in Jezebel Leviathan, you know, and they're expecting blessings and, and continuing to control, manipulate, hurt people and lie and deceive. No, don't expect blessings until you get your life right with Christ, you know, and that could be speaking to pastors, pastors' wives, it could be speaking to those in the, oh, you know, healing rooms and deliverance ministries. You know, we have to be honest, look ourselves in the mirror. So anyways, all righty, I think that's it. So keep your peace on and keep on the fighting, it's, a, it's worth it, don't give up. In fact, I had one, one gentleman was telling me, you know, I was ready to give up and I went through some struggles with my wife and it was just too hard. And then after like a day of, of giving up, he's like, you know what, that's not me, that's not who I am, I can't give up, no way. You know, and so he got back into the battle again. And so, you know, I never ever even discerned all this stuff going back to 2008, not until 2009 before I started to understand and discern, have my spiritual eyes opened. And all of a sudden I started seeing this stuff and I'm thinking, oh my gosh, I didn't see this before. That's why so many people that have Jezebel Leviathan, they don't see it, they don't even see it in themselves. They strive and fight with their spouse, blame their spouse for everything. And it's them, it's not the spouse. And that's why it's so hard, so. Anyway, keep the battle gear on and enjoy the trials and tribulations. If you can, if you can take yourself, put it this way, if you're going through a trial and tribulation, if you can take yourself out of your current circumstance and look at it from God's perspective or from an eagle eye perspective from above and say, you know what? Here's my life today on the timeline of the continuance of my life. So if, uh, if it's say it's, uh, I don't know, six feet long is your entire length of your life mapped out. Maybe you're into you know, two feet into that living or maybe four feet into it. If you can say, you know what? All the stuff I'm going through, all it is is the enemy circumstantially trying to come against and buffet me. I'm not gonna worry about anything because I know it's gonna end good because I'm positioning my life with the Lord and he's gonna make all things work together for my good. Then you can get through the trials and tribulations. If someone's lying about you, spreading rumors, whatever, say, you know what? It's nothing, nothing. I'm gonna be blessed more for that. In fact, the Lord told me that just a couple weeks ago. He said, Nelson, I'm going to bless you like you've never seen. You know, count it all joy when you're going through these trials and tribulations. Because what will come out of it is you'll become stronger for it. You'll become more anointed for it. It'll all be worth it in the end. And so you can rest in that. And you know, like, I don't worry about nothing ever. I don't complain. I don't say, oh my gosh, I wish you didn't have to go through this. You know, just uh, enjoy the ride of the trials and tribulations, knowing that it's making you stronger, giving you more patience so that you can become stronger and more anointed. I know a lot of people will come to me and to others that are fully in their ministries and say, I want your anointing. Give me your anointing. I want the mantle, blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, really? I'm like, you want to go through what I went through? Like a lot of times they have no clue what it took to get through to where you're at. And so that speaks hopefully to a lot of you that are going through stuff right now, saying, I can do this. I am more than a conqueror. And I'm not afraid, I'm not afraid at all. I'm not afraid of a little rattlesnake. So in fact, why don't we go to the front door? I'll open it up and show you where the sneaky sneaky was. I'll show the floor. Wait, I'm showing the ceiling now. <laughs> there we go. I'll walk to the front door. It was right there. Bing. So basically, I didn't see it. I didn't see it until, I don't know, I was probably like, oh, there's my car. Until I was like right here. And I started walking, and I'm like, oh my gosh. 
there's a snake. I'm like, I should record this. And I didn't hear, even hear the rattle. And then uh, when I started recording it, I got to like about right here and started going rattle, 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 rattle. And so I literally had to walk through the door. Right there was the snake. <laughs> And uh, I was, I don't know, I didn't feel any fear. I was like annoyed with it. I wanted to step on it. <laughs> but I ended up opening the door up and then cursing it and then walking out or in, in here to the entryway. And I then went to bed. I didn't have any worry or fear and uh, I expected it to disappear and be gone. And I woke up in the morning and opened the door and it was gone, so. In fact, it's interesting because the homeowners here said, Dawn said that she had never seen any snakes here for the two years I've lived here. So how interesting is that? Again, I believe it was very symbolic, very symbolic because the enemy was trying to literally keep me from coming into my destiny, wanted to stop me. Um, and I was tired. I'm like, you know what? I don't care what, you know, I'm going in there and uh, you cannot stop me. You're not going to bite me. No worries. And, um, and then uh, also it's very symbolic for Jezebel, um, especially the rattlesnakes because they're poisonous and stuff. So anyways, um, I think that's about it. So stay strong in what you're going through. If you're going through stuff, count it all as joy. Take yourself out of your current situation and try to see yourself the way God sees it and says, you know what? This is nothing, my son. This is nothing, my daughter. This is only making you stronger. Now there was a song by somebody, if it won't kill you, it'll make you stronger. Some girl sings that I know is popular, secular song. But um, there's some truth to that. There's oftentimes a lot of truth in various songs that are sang from a spiritual perspective that are not spiritual songs. So we have to get to that point where we're not afraid of anything. You know, that's what it says in the Bible. We're supposed to be able to trample on that stuff. Now will I go out there and try and jump into a bunch of pits of rattlesnakes? No, <laughs> you know. Um, not if I don't have to, but if I did, you know, just think about uh, Daniel. Daniel and the uh, lion's den. That's it, Kelly Clarkson, yeah. She was the first winner, remember, of the American Idol. I remember that, so. Anyways, alrighty. Well, I see some people that are messaging me now to attend on Friday night, so I will uh, get after that, and then I'm gonna focus on getting my book, Pure and Spotless hopefully completed over the next couple weeks. I'm gonna get it done by the end of August and get it out. And, uh, cause that's really what's gonna usher in Christ's return is that a lot of us, if we're operating in the stuff that we don't wanna operate in, you know, God knows our hearts, he knows our minds. And if we're operating in junk, we don't wanna be operating in that stuff. We wanna get out of that to where we're pure and spotless, where we don't have the desire for sin anymore. In fact, I think it was Jeremy Camp last night that was talking about that is that when you are totally in love with the Lord, and he didn't talk about, you know, freed from the demons, but you will have no desires for sin. It doesn't have an appeal anymore. You know, you're, you can uh, look upon, if you're a guy, you can look upon a woman that's beautiful with a godly look, not lust. You know, if you're a woman looking at a guy, I guess they lust as well, but uh, maybe in a different way, I don't know. Um, but you can, and people can sense, they can sense people that are pure. In fact, animals can sense that. Animals can sense when you are pure. It's funny because this dog that was uh, here on Sunday at the home, um, it immediately wanted me to like, it wanted me to sit down so it could get on my lap. And I'm like, really? <laughs> I'm like, what kind of forward dog are you? You know, and the dog's name was Honey. Um, but it was a very precious dog and uh, loved to like cuddle with me. And I'm like, wow, you know, I don't even know you, you know? <laughs> But it's fun, you know, because dogs can sense that. Dogs can sense if they are, if you're a godly person, I, I really believe that. Um, you know, I, I mean, I've seen it in my own life. I've seen it with another dog, another doggy from Texas that uh, always likes me when I come around there. So anyways, all right, I'm gonna let you guys go. I don't wanna be on here forever. Oh my gosh, it's been almost 44 minutes. So have fun today, enjoy your life. And if you come upon a rattlesnake, no worries. Walk right past it. You know, walk on it if you want to. <laughs> yeah, so anyways. Alrighty, see you later. Love you, bye.